Thank you for joining the Outbound and the Outpass virtual mid-year conference on addressing evolving systemic risks and the challenges. My name is Grace Lee, President and the CEO of Taiwan Ratings and the concurrently Outpass Board Director. I'm your moderator for the opening session. Now, let me introduce you the first speaker Aqua's chairman, Mr. Asushi Mazuda. He plays various important roles at the Japan rating, credit rating agency, including counselor for the international affairs, chief analyst for international rating department, and the chief sustainable finance analyst for sustainable finance evaluation group. Okay, thank you very much, Grace. At the beginning, as a chairman of ACWA, I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Acevedo and all the Asian Bankers Association colleagues. This is a very current topic for all the financial sector. We greatly appreciate all the speakers and audience who gather here today. I have only two minutes that I just raised one point at, at the beginning. Digital bank loan is a new phenomenon, which we encountered in the recent case of bank resolutions, and we need to address in all banking sector analysis in the world. But we have to distinguish between risk analysis and policy action. For the cases of Silicon Valley Bank and the First Republic Bank, I think root cause is an idiosyncratic risk of market risk mismanagement of these banks. Policy action is unprecedented in fear of systemic risk. 100% coverage of deposit insurance. Further contagion of the market volatility has been muted by these policy action. But this apparently evoke issue of moral hazard. We have two issues from these experiences. First, how much capital buffer is sufficient to stabilize the digital bank loan? Or can we contain risk the digital bank loan simply raising the capital buffer floor? In other words, do we need Basel 5 or another enhanced regulation? Second is how can we improve analysis of contagion risk? After the Asian crisis and the 2008 global financial crisis, balance sheet contagion has been focused. But still, I wish to ask, do we know sufficiently about those contagions? I stop here. I wish active discussion in today's three hours uh, discussion. So I can go back to that, uh, great. Thank you very much. Oh, let me introduce you the next speaker, ABAS chairman, Mr. Eugene Acevedo. He is also the president and the CEO of RCBC in the Philippines. Prior to the current job, he had the senior leadership positions in several banks, mainly including Philippine National Bank, Union Bank, and the City Bank. Now, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Acevedo, Good afternoon, Mr. Masuda, friends from the Association of Credit Rating Agencies and the ASEAN at the Asian Bankers Association. We are in perilous times and for new reasons. There was the virus, and then recently we had one that was triggered by treasury bonds. Treasury bonds. Imagine that. For the longest time, I've been a banker for over 30 years. We call these instruments risk-free. I am not sure we should call them that anymore. And then digital banking gives rise to cybersecurity, data theft, and other new risks. Seriously, what stays constant is the need for evaluation of these new risks, especially if they're systemic, and for the need of the banking system to be resilient. I think now 
we need to rewrite some chapters in the credit rating and banking textbooks, really, to ensure that the recent, recent lessons are never forgotten. And this conference is exactly what we need to ensure that everyone at least gets equipped with a certain level of knowledge and really start moving in the right direction. So thank you to the organizers. Thanks everyone for attending this event and good day to all. Now, let me move, let's move on to today's first session on addressing systemic risks in credit ratings. And let me introduce you the session one moderator, Mr. Fahim Aman, Vice Chairman of Aqua. He has more than 30 years of experience in credit ratings and established BIS credit rating agency in Pakistan and turn around the Islamic International Rating Agency in Bahrain. Uh, just to remind the participants that this is one of the continuing joint conferences held on the platform of uh, ACRA and ABBA uh, patronage. Um, this part is very interesting, as um, uh, Mr. Masuda San said, and followed by the message that addressing systemic risk in credit rating becomes a very important part right now, because as th three decades of experience in ratings, I believe that if credit ratings are misaligned with actual risk, then it can contribute to systemic vulnerabilities. Without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Ms. Sabine Saleem as the first speaker on the subject. Ms. Sabine is the Chief Executive Officer at uh, Islamic International Rating Agency in Bahrain. She has been associated with the credit rating industry for over two decades. And she has been pioneer, pioneering uh, sector studies in Pakistan. And now she is leading uh, in 13 countries, in OIC countries from Bahrain. She's a chartered financial analyst, and she has a master's degree in business administration with a focus on finance and economics. So I will basically go into some of the, some points that I came across while uh, looking at systemic risk and thinking about it again. And I will take some cues from the, the, uh, the speakers who, Introduce the session, Masood Hassan, and uh, also Mr. Fahim, and uh, everyone here today. And uh, inshallah, we hope to have an insightful session with uh, a good question answers at the end of it. Uh, firstly, as I said, I'd like to start with a few points and a few questions. Uh, the most uh, important thing, just to start and kick off the discussion, is that systemic risk obviously is when we see isolated risks. Uh, in one part of the economy, in one part of the financial system, or we could say firm level risks, which have the potential to grow into uh, a full-fledged systemic breakdown, system-wide breakdown. So this obviously is, by its very nature, systemic risk is the culmination of these segregated risks. We talk first about, mostly about the financial system, but it's just important to remember that uh, Systemic risk is a concept which is uh, important for financial side of things as well as the financial sector. The financial sector has its linkages both ways into systemic risk into the of the non-financial sector. In the non-financial sector, for example, if we see uh, the systemic crisis of 2007, 2008, it resulted in a choke out of funding to the corporate sector which resulted in some of the major bailouts that had to be done in the corporate sector, in the automotive sector of the US. Uh, we also see that, you know, for instance, if there are risks developing in one part of the economy, let's say if there is an oil price hike, uh, it could cause a breakdown of the logistics sector, which in turn means that the supply chains could be disrupted. And this could translate into risks back into the, uh, through non-performing loans, through um, a non-performing corporate sector, which could have its reflection again on the, on the financial sector. So the whole thing has to be viewed on an economy-wide basis. Later in this presentation, we will also talk about how systemic risk in the financial sector can trigger a crisis on, the, on even sovereign debt repayment schedules. So 
Of course, this is something which is very pertinent to rating agencies. And it is something that uh, needs to talk, be talked about both, not just when we're talking about ratings on the financial sector side or on the sovereign risk side, but also in the non-financial sector. Um, I will start by asking a few questions from myself. Uh, firstly, we know that when the crisis happened, the, the global financial crisis of 2008, rating agencies were alleged to be part of the problem. The whole chain of events, when we look at it, rating agencies are, are deemed to have had a role to play. And what can we do, one, to avoid the perception that we can be players in a financial crisis? And I'll be speaking, obviously, from the perspective of an international rating agency. And after this session, we will have another panel discussion where um, some of my respected experts from uh, other jurisdictions would be speaking about uh, some of the major debt markets in the world and how their uh, system and their market caters to, to addressing systemic risk and how do they build it into uh, the, their rating assessments. But from our point of view, I would like to ask a few basic questions, which is that uh, rating actions for instance, they are deemed to have a boom bias, meaning that ratings might be too high in the good times. Uh, we will deal with this a bit later in the presentation in a little bit more detail. Uh, but obviously, because ratings are built into both domestic level as well as global regulations, they're so well integrated into the system, it is uh, important to realize that if ratings are on the higher side during good times, during boom periods, then of course there is a potential that risk will be underestimated and it will result in, um, it can result in two things. One, excessive leverage, excessive risk taking, and also it might result in something else, which is when the when things take a turn for the, for, the, for the worse, it can result into very steep, very sharp, uh, and very sudden rating actions moving south which means that uh, this again will in turn result in an erosion of market confidence, which also means that it can perpetuate the problem, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about systemic risk. So ratings are very much have a definite role to play to be, uh, to be able to contain the, any development of systemic risk factors within any system, the global system or uh, domestic system. So this much is clear. Later in the presentation, we will try to answer some of these questions. Some of these are easy to answer and others are a little bit more difficult. As uh, Mr. Bissan also stated, that one of the most important things is that how do we build the potential contagion into our ratings? Uh, the potential of a systemic risk, systemic breakdown. How do we build it in ratings ahead of time? Ratings are supposed to be not too late, yes, but they're also not supposed to be too early because you might uh, uh, trigger what we call the self-fulfilling prophecy in ratings, which is when ratings can become, uh, you know, if too much of a warning is given or the signal is too negative, then it can result in an unnecessary amount of confidence erosion too early, which can simply create a problem uh, where there is none. So it's very important. And because that is the case, it is important that our approach is very balanced. And another point I, I would like to touch upon during this 20-minute uh, session, which I would want later the panelists to also address, is that we feel, and we have a whole session afterwards where we're going to have a discussion on policy matters as well. I, I, we feel that ratings, the way ratings are integrated into regulations can sometimes also be a problem. Not rating actions themselves, but the way they are built into regulations, the way they are built into investment policy. That can also be a problem because if there are cliff effects which are built into ratings, for instance, uh, free access to all types of funds in investment grade range and no access in the sub-investment grade range, it can result in sudden drops in choking liquidity to the market with one rating action and it can again perpetuate the problem. So the way ratings are embedded in regulation is also a very important point which I think we will discuss throughout this presentation and we would want the panelists at the end of it to also uh, share their thoughts on. Another thing that I think uh, uh, is worth thinking about is the potential for 
isolated risks into becoming full-fledged breakdown. So there is this concept of width, how far uh, systemic risk can go. It can start from the financial sector. It can go into the corporate sector, the non-financial corporate sector. It can go into uh, sovereign debt repayment related problems. But another point that we need to keep in mind is the is the length of the crisis, which means that even when the situation has been resolved, and even though we're not in the midst, midst of uh, the earliest systemic crisis, of course, it could resolve itself over time, its effects can still be felt. There are, of course, new risk factors that are developing at the present time, but we're still feeling the effects from the the first systemic crisis in, in 2007-2008. It remains one of the most relevant areas of discussion. Whenever we talk about systemic risk, we cannot uh, not talk about the 2008 crisis, where something as simple as, uh, as isolated as the subprime crisis, where the mortgage market collapsed had been the beginning. And since these securities had been uh, packaged off in AAA rated securities, again, that's where we come in, highly rated securities. Uh, the, the, the players in the financial markets were extremely highly leveraged. Perhaps there was inadequate regulation and supervision. Since then, of course, we've seen a completely uh, revamped regulatory supervision framework, which is uh, much more cautious in its uh, approach. And it does not really allow uh, much risk taking in order to perhaps protect against future systemic risk. And we'll come to that too. So the point that I wanted to make was that we have to keep in mind, not just the width, the, the width or the scale of the crisis, but also the years over which it continues to have an impact. So, so far we figured out that the regulatory framework and the alacrity with which the regulators respond is perhaps the most effective strategy against systemic risk. Firstly, the way regulation evolved after the 2008 crisis, it uh, protected against heavy risk taking and also built in extra buffers in entities which have the potential of becoming, uh, who have the potential of becoming larger contributors to uh, systemic risk. So this was done, plus there was of course, uh, this segregation between systemically important banks at the domestic level, at individual country level, and there were globally important banks, the GSIPs at global level. This was an important designation to protect against uh, crises of a similar scale, which have global um, global implications. So uh, how regulation builds in ratings, I feel is central to protecting the system from any exacerbation of risk that may be caused even by very accurately given, not, not very high, very accurate, very balanced and very timely rating actions. Now, today we're looking at uh, another situation as we, we just spoke about at the beginning of the session, that we're talking about the risk that has come from treasuries, which we always studied. I mean, this was throughout the theme in our, uh, in our student days also and in our in our practice of work also that the US Treasury is the risk-free rate. And we, we saw what happened when monetary tightening commenced. And we saw that, of course, there are risks to financial institutions as we've seen collapses in both US as well as in Europe coming out of uh, simply the loss in market value of securities. Of course, there are other losses also that are putting banks at risks. We are looking at an increase in funding costs in general, both for the corporate sector as well as for the financial sector. We're looking at compressed margins, so low profitability. We're looking at the direct cost of credit losses. And this is where I have spoken about earlier that we see linkages between the financial system and the corporate segment, which means that you know uh, an increase in funding costs for the non-financial sector can trigger direct costs of credit losses to the banks. Then of course, the cost of capital is heightened because there's increase in the risk of loans. So ECL provisions have to be made. And at the end of the day, if there is a crash in one bank, it serves to reduce, erode the confidence in the entire market with shares in the banking sector falling. So there is a there is a two-way linkage into capital markets. And then of course, uh, there is erosion of confidence in certain types of securities, like in the banking sector in 81, uh, in uh, tier one losses. So we're looking again at the buildup of 
uh, the situation, which can lead to a problem. However, so far, I feel that the regulatory response, at least so far, has effectively limited the contagion. But we may not be seen. We may not have seen the. Uh, we may not have seen the worst yet. I mean, because uh, the the monetary tightening process continues, and uh, we we see that this can continue to become uh, a problem. We also saw in China, for instance, with the bankruptcy filing of Evergrande. Uh, and we saw stress reported in uh, many other real estate sector companies uh, looking at a possible problem of systemic risk, even in China and uh, with repercussions elsewhere. Uh, and of course, we have seen that these things in the past have triggered uh, a, a problem with the financial sector, sector has in the past triggered a crisis uh, with the Asian Tigers crisis started with the financial sector also went on to become a debt repayment crisis at the sovereign level and, of course, with the GFC, the global financial crisis. And even the recent downgrades that we've seen in the market, both at sovereign risk level, they are a case of consideration. Now I'll come to answering the questions because I've just been told that I have only three minutes. Um, the first question that I asked was, what if ratings have a boom bias? What if they're too high? So the first most important thing is, obviously, that each of our ratings has to be backed by thorough analysis and it is uh, it is the timeliness of ratings is very important whereby regular review and giving adequate warnings through outlook changes it can it can ensure that the ratings are timely and of course this is built into our dna it's built into our ethics so this is the first thing that rating agencies need to be careful about as i'm sure all of us are and then also by giving information to the market regarding transition stats which is basically the movement of ratings across a period of time and across bands. This is very important because, uh, uh, you know, the idea is that ratings should be steady through economic cycles. I'm obviously, because ratings cannot really take into account the risk of a full, full blown contagion before its time, there will be movement, but at least minor economic cycles, ratings should be at least the idea is that ratings should remain steady throughout it. Um, and now, now the big question, the potential for how systemic risk can be built into ratings systemically to avoid sharp movements. The answer to this question from my perspective as an international rating agency is that whenever we go into markets where, uh, you know, the system is either overly concentrated or very, very much connected and overly concentrated, and where we see, see weaknesses developing in isolated corners here and there, there, in terms of our assessment of the system itself, the sector ceilings that we say within the banking system, there we we take and we build our, the, the risk factors into the assessment of risk on a sector wide basis, which means that it sets the ceiling of ratings and we don't go beyond on a certain level so that, you know, the, the fall from, from grace is not as steep as it could be had this not been taken into account. Having said this, I think it's important to say that you know, it is not possible to, to fully build in the, the risk of a contagion by nature of both what ratings are supposed to be, timely, not too early, not too late, accurate, not too high, not too low, but also because of the rating of the animal, that uh, the, the animal itself of systemic risk, I mean, the, the nature of the animal itself. So it is, it is not possible to really build that in. But one point before I leave, I see other speakers uh, uh, coming up. So the one point that I want to see is that what, what we've learned is that clear communication to markets is very important. How much of systemic risk are you building into your sector-wide ratings? How much is, what do you think are the precipitative factors which can potentially trigger such a crisis? And what is the estimation of sector risk based on its vulnerability to these factors? These three things, I think rating agencies should make a very genuine effort to communicate to the markets so that investors know how much has been built in, how much has not been built in. And I think this already happened on the global rating uh, sector, but this is something that I think we need to see more in uh, domestic markets, uh, independent domestic markets. Uh, thank you very much for your thought-provoking presentation. I will now uh, take a get into the second section uh, session, which is the reflecting of systemic risk in credit uh, ratings 
in the context of the national rating agency. So now I will invite uh, Ms. Uh, Christine Zhang uh, from China, and uh, she is from uh, uh, Chinese uh, Chengzing Rating Agency. She has been uh, conducting responsible for sovereign ratings, panda bond ratings, and international cooperation. Mm -hmm. And she has been, uh, Ms. Heng has helped the establish the relationship with various rating partners, including VIS Group and, and the German Rating Agency. She has a bachelor's degree of economics, master's degree of macroeconomics from Renamon University of China. So I now invite uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Christine Zhang. I would like to share with you the systemic risk mitigation of Chinese banking sector. Uh, on the first page, actually, you could see that the China's financial system is actually dominated by uh, indirect financing, with banking assets accounting for, you know, more than 90% of the financial system, while the six large state-owned banks, they account for more than 40% of the total banking assets. And if we, we are comparing globally, uh, in terms of the total assets of the Chinese banking system, actually the ratio of that to GDP was 262% at the end of 2022, which is much higher than that of the US. If we are going to talk about only the commercial banks, actually the size is almost two times of the US, which ranks second in the world. And here, you know, I listed some of the major indicators of the Chinese banking sector, and you could see that most of them perform above average globally. So over these years, there has been a structural change in the Chinese economy, and that is putting pressure on the asset quality of the banking system. So here actually I listed two of the emerging risks. So, so far actually, uh, I'm wondering if I can call it systemic risk currently. So one is definitely the policy change in the Chinese property market, and that can be dated back to 2016. Uh, there has been an overall tightening of the real estate regulation policies. And this has, you know, slowed down the overall development of the real estate industry in China. And also since the second half of 2021, with the further tightening of the financing policies, uh, large scale real estate companies has experienced the liquidity crisis uh, leading to frequent credit risk events. And this liquidity risk has actually put pressure on the asset quality of the banking sector. As of the end of 2022, the real estate related loans of major financial institutions in China reached 53.2 trillion yuan, and that accounts for almost 25% of the total banking loan. And another emerging risk is the increasing debt burden on local governments. You know that in China, the local governments frequently raise funds through LGFVs to meet the gap between total expenditures and revenues. The LGFV is what they call the local government financing vehicles. And by the end of 2022, uh, the total debt of LGFV has reached 59 trillion yuan, and that accounts for roughly half of GDP. And you know, this kind of debt can be considered as implicit debt of local governments. So while the debt, of the debt burden of the LGFV increases, actually the support capacity of the local governments has deteriorated. And that is mainly due to the repeated COVID situation in the past three years, and also the crisis in the property market. Because in China, you know, the government used to rely very much on the land sales. And the revenue from land sales decreased by 23% last year. So next, let's dive into these separate risks. So when we first come to the property market, actually the scale of this market has returned to the level of 2017. By the end of 2022, after several rounds of risk clearing, and currently we can see that the credit fundamentals has almost bottomed out. Even okay. now, we still see some cri some, some crisis in this market. Um, we can see that the credit fundamentals of property market has bottomed out. And uh, since 2022, it, there have been multiple support policies impl implemented, and the banks are encouraged to support the property market in a stable and orderly manner, uh, most through the debt over or you know provide such kind of M and A uh, loans to this property, property market. 
And also, you know, the Chinese banks are direct exposures to real estate corporates actually not material. They account for only 7% of the total gross loan at the end of 2022. And most of these loans are well collateralized. So which means there will be a, a mitigated loss in the event of a default. And Thanks. if we're talking about the LGF risks, about the LGF risk, actually in total, we don't expect these kind of risks to be material because there will be a gradual but steady uh, burden sharing of LGF restructuring process. And definitely the banks will play an important role in terms of the risk mitigation uh, and also by debt rollover or debt restructuring. And yes, definitely some regional banks in weak regions, they will remain vulnerable uh, to this kind of LGF risk. So last but not least, actually, the regulators in China has set enough buffers for the banking sector to maintain financial stability. So here I listed, you know, some uh, major measures taken by the regulators in China to maintain the financial stability. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will uh, request uh, Mr. Osgur Fuad from JCR Eurasia, Turkey, to give his reflection on the systemic risk built in into his uh, jurisdiction and how JCR Eurasia looks at the systemic risk. Uh, and he has been associated with JCR Eurasia since 2014. He has a um, double major uh, degree in sociology and management from Middle East Technical University. And he's a CFA charter holder since 2017 and a member of CF Institute and CFA Society Istanbul. I welcome Mr. Osgur, please. Uh, so, in response to the brilliant presentation by Sabine and also from uh, Ms. Shang, uh, I will, would like to give some color about uh, our experience in Turkey and Turkey with respect to systemic risk. Uh, so, just a few key facts that I have not put here. Uh, these are important for all these uh, points to make sense. Uh, as JCI Eurasia rating in Turkey, uh, we are the only credit rating agency uh, that is recognized as an external credit rating uh, agency. So this means, and there's also a rating mandate in Turkey at the moment. So this means any Turkish company operating here with a debt from banking system in excess of $15 million is required to have an external credit rating. So any entity operating in Turkey with a that book of $15 million or more has to be rated by ourselves. So we cover pretty much all of the like large companies in Turkey. So in our experience, uh, and the pandemic shock, of course, one of the most uh, significant shocks in recent history. Uh, so in our experience, we had firsthand uh, witnessed how a potential contagion could affect the banking system and then the uh, non-banking system, the non-FI system. So these are some stylus facts. As you can see them, I will not devote much time on them, but the idea is the vast majority of financing is from banks. And most of the that most of the loans that the borrowers take are used to finance their working capital. So if banks were to stop lending, then that will have like a vicious circle. Uh, and banks cannot lend, real service cannot, uh, cannot service their debts and all falls apart. So in that, uh, a rapid fire actions from both the government and also Banking Association of Turkey uh, has come into place. And the general idea was this. We know there is a systemic shock applied here. Uh, there are forced lockdowns. The people cannot go to work. The production has stalled and they cannot generate revenues as a result. So if they cannot generate revenues, then they cannot service their debt. So we have to bridge this period so that they do not fail on those that because of this force majeure. So most of the regulations were aimed at providing liquidity to the real sector. And also for the banks, uh, they changed the classification so that the banks will not be afraid of actually uh, classifying those loans. I mean, they, they were not forced to classify those loans as you know, non-performing loans because that would distort their uh, balance sheets that would distort their capital adequacy ratios and all. So uh, there were some facilities to support the bank's balance sheets, to support the bank's uh, core ratios. So as a result, the financing had not stopped. In fact, there were some aimed targeted credit facilities to most affected sectors 
so the funding uh, kept kept on and we managed to persevere both as the real sector and as the banking sector but the general idea is this ultimately this was in a way the state the government in a way supporting funding to the banking system and the banking system providing liquidity to the real sector so ultimately this led us to think that as a rating analyst uh, our job is even more difficult because we do not only rate the entity itself, but we also have to pay very much attention to the state's capacity to absorb these losses. So this was the lesson learned on our part. And thankfully, we had just recently overhauled our methodology to incorporate better the state's capacity to absorb those shocks. So we were in a bit better position. But going forward, I think this is one of the major uh, concerns, which was also outlined by the uh, panelists before me. So I think going forward, uh, we should be ever mindful about those possible contagions. And we know ultimately it will go to the central bank or the government itself to step in and provide support. Uh, so uh, as a perhaps this parental support, this government support is almost uh, as important as rating the entity itself. So with that, uh, I'll leave it to Mr. Fahim again. Thank you. Uh, now I will invite the last reactor, Mr. Ranjan Sharma from CARE. Uh, he is a, a professional with 20 years of experience and has been associated with uh, the CARE rating agency for 17 years. And uh, he, is, he heads the, uh, the large corporate, uh, corporate analytical verticals in, 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 with CARE. He is an MBA finance by qualification. So I invite now uh, Ranjan Sharma from CARE to give his thoughts. Thank you, Sabine, for describing the far-reaching implications of systemic risks on the financial sector. As a reactor, I will present my views from the Indian context. I would be discussing two major instances related to systemic risks in the financial sector in India, which had the potential to disturb the entire system. Let me first explain these two events, and then I will discuss how these risks were addressed to protect the financial sector. The first event happened in 2002, when the mutual fund industry in India had just started to evolve. Unit Trust of India, which was promoted by the government of India, had a small saving plan, which was popularly known as US-64. It was a massive success with investors, as it was delivering very good returns. However, in 2002, there was an equity market crash due to an avalanche in the technology sector, and suddenly there were panic withdrawals by the investors from the scheme, which posed a serious threat to the mutual fund investments in the country. The second event happened just a few years back in 2020, when Yes Bank, which was the sixth largest private sector bank in India, was on the verge of bankruptcy due to sharp increase in its non-performing assets. This instance too had the potential to derail the banking sector in the country. Let us now look at how these events were tackled by the government of India and the central bank. In case of UTI, the government put an immediate break on withdrawals from the mutual fund scheme and simultaneously approved a bailout package whereby close to rupees 14,500 crores was infused in the scheme to restore investors' confidence. Gradually, with the recovery of the share market, the scheme was revived with no loss to the investors. In fact, point to be noted is that even the government received back its entire bailout investment post full redemption of the scheme. The government's demonstrated stance to safeguard the small investors thus gave a boost to the mutual fund industry in the country. Now, the second case is on Yes Bank. Here, the Central Bank of India, along with some leading public sector banks, played a pivotal role to ensure that no harm was caused to the banking sector in the country. As a first step, the Central Bank directed to write off the entire 81 bonds of the bank. Post this, the largest public sector bank of the country, State Bank of India, along with few private sector banks, invested around rupees 10,000 crore in Yes Bank to revive its operations. The erstwhile management of the bank was replaced by a professional board 
and within a very short span of time, Yes Bank was revived and there was no loss to the depositors of the bank. Timely implementation of corrective steps by the central bank thus ensured that public confidence was maintained in the banking system. Now to summarize, uh, we can see that some of the critical factors which have enabled us to deal effectively with systemic risks in the financial sector in India are, first, stringent governance structure, which does not allow the contagion to develop without getting noticed. The central bank has been very vigilant and responsive to any developing systemic risk in the country. Second, stringent liquidity norms for the banks operating in the country so that they can withstand unforeseen situations of liquidity crisis. Then there is strong oversight of the central bank through periodic audit and inspections of critically important financial sector intermediaries, a base of strong institutions in the financial sector across banks, insurance companies, and mutual funds provides a lot of comfort in dealing with any systemic risk. Finally, there has been timely action by the government and the central bank whenever any systemic risk was encountered, which was also witnessed during the COVID-19 pandemic. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Now we open the floor for a question and answer session. Just to kick off, maybe I will just give my question to the panelists about when we were talking about systemic and systematic risk when Sharma talked about Indian uh, um, uh, for policy makers and Indian government in intervention to save the to to save the um, uh, big institutions. Is it still true, too big to fail, TBT, TBF to still hold? Even after Dodd-Frank Act 2010, and we saw, saw in, in USA, they let go the first Republican bank and uh, now Evergrande, China government is not coming in to help it. And it may trigger other uh, construction companies. Yes, Ms. Fahim. Actually, uh, as I just introduced, the Chinese banking sector actually plays a very important role in terms of the credit risk system, systemic risk mitigation because it owns like 90% of the financial system is actually of, uh, is about the banking. And, you know, also in China, it's a very unique system that there's a large interconnected financial system with all the governments, banks, state-owned enterprises. They are actually internal connected. So, which means this kind of and the banking actually pro, uh, plays in the center in the center as an important role. So, I think China has the ability to mobilize resources efficiently to maintain financial stability in the case of systemic risk emerging from whether from property market or from LGFVs. But definitely, banks uh, as they they are playing the, the central role as a risk mitigation role. So that is why the banking system in China is too big to fail. Maybe a reflection from Sabine, from the context of the international uh, as a rating agency and what uh, she does looking at the different aspects in different jurisdictions, please. Yes, I was saying that uh, uh, we're talking about India and China, which are both economically, I think, in a very on a very strong footing. So we also need to keep in mind the will may be there to protect against or to timely intervene, sometimes with cash injection. Even in case of Turkey, we have seen that there have been cash injections into the state banks uh, again in 2023 and previously also, as uh, Brother Oscar would, uh, uh, could, could perhaps uh, maybe talk about. But uh, I think it is very important to see that, you know, the capacity has to be there. So depending the scale of the crisis and depending on the jurisdiction in question, or even when we think about it on a global scale, we need to think about the fact that, you know, at some point the capacity will run out. So uh, the important thing to do is really to be mindful of it from the regulatory perspective and to keep up the supervision, the market communication, and build in the buffers, which is which is the route that the global regulators took after the 2008 uh, crisis. So we we do expect just more of that, as uh, Masuda Sena had also pointed out in his uh, uh, beginning remarks, and maybe a Basel five could be coming every time we we learn from my experience 
and we have to basically beef up the market in a way that uh, you know we basically try to protect against a contagion to the extent that it is practically doable because at some point the resources could could run out to intervene and uh, do this of course in both india and china not only is the resource present but also the the, the supervisory framework as we understand is very strong and this uh, theory is already built in that the regulator will step in to protect and it is the market's perception. The market has also bought into this. Uh, but for other jurisdictions, I think generally speaking, I feel that the way to go is market communication, both from regulators as well as from uh, rating agencies themselves. I think this point I really want to uh, ring in that this is something that really came up after the global financial crisis, but in domestic jurisdictions, uh, we feel that the communication from rating agencies regarding which factors they have identified as those which are going to lead to a systemic crisis, what is the relative vulnerability of the system, and how well do you think the system will be able to cope to what extent? Thank you. Uh, there are two questions now. One is, what are the consequences on systematic risk in the banking sector, not systemic risk? So I will just like to answer myself. Systematic risk, uh, whoever has put in this question, is non-diversifiable, non it's a market risk. So like wars or political crisis, severe political crisis can trigger this. The systemic risk is a, is a different kind of, uh, it, 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 it initiate, it's initiated by a company or an institution or a sector. So that was my answer to that. And then another question, Mr. Sharma gave two good examples of regulatory intervention in India to save the systemic incidents. Can our other colleagues from Turkey, China, or Middle East can share some examples if we have one. Turkey, if we have one, I don't recall. Uh, Osgur, uh, no. some uh, ASEAN bank, right? Which was uh, closed down and it was not saved, right? But that was a different uh, example. Yeah, precisely. I mean, in the near history, we did not have like a near default of a major or a small bank. So, uh, I can only give examples about the preventive measures before things escalate. Not, not, not the credit. Yeah. Uh, Masbada Sain has very well said that there is a difference between these two. Uh, okay, my other question would be, my other question would be with the raters here, in, in the local jurisdiction, like, like we have seen in right now in uh, Sri Lanka, they have written off nearly 50% their national debt and the treasury certificates. What happens to our ratings within the jurisdiction, the national scale ratings, if this uh, uh, a sovereign defaults, what would happen to our ratings then? This is my question, which I keep asking myself. Can Sharma and uh, uh, Christine can help, help me on this uh, or Oscar, please? I think in terms of say ratings of specific corporates, uh, it will follow the credit profile of that specific entity, even if suppose the sovereign defaults, if uh, it will vary, you know, its impact on a specific credit, specific company can vary from a company to company. Now, if suppose there is a stronger entity, which can withstand, uh, even if the sovereign defaults, then its rating will be reflected of that. For example, we have certain corporates who have ratings from global rating agencies, which are higher than the country's sovereign rating itself. So that's one part. And maybe certain entities whose, uh, whose trade profile is weaker uh, in the overall context, those can get Im impacted because, and especially if suppose they have a lot of foreign currency borrowings. So this is something which I can think of. Yes, I think I can totally agree with uh, Sharma on what he has said. And also, you know, for, uh, even if, if there is a, you know, even if there's a downgrade in terms of sovereign rating, there could have large scale impacts on the, all the local domestic issues actually. And uh, we can't uh, think of, you know, a default. A default definitely means uh, another thing. So there can be altered in terms of domestic skill and international skill. And uh, for example, for China's case, actually, if there is a downgrade occur on the sovereign rating of China, actually, nearly 85% because of the debt issuers in China is state-owned companies. So they can all be linked with the sovereign rating. So even if there's a downgrade, there can be large impacts on the, the international skill rating of Chinese entities. 
uh, yes. So this is my comment. Okay. But there is another very interesting question. Uh, how do we identify bubbles in due time, Sabine? Rating agencies should be watching out the trends that they are uh, that are beginning to form. Uh, but it's a, it's a tricky question. I mean, uh, there is not really, I think what we have been doing recently in most analyst circles, both inside rating agency circles as well as outside, is trying to use data, big data, to generate uh, ideas regarding which factors could be in, uh, um, you know, uh, in incipient development stages. But it is a matter of experience. It is a matter of uh, continuous research, continuously uh, keeping a uh, view on, on the dynamics of macroeconomic uh, measures developing, macroeconomic bubbles developing. Um, but there is no, no really scientific way to answer this question. I so uh, the last answer I need from one of the panelists, is there a defined standard duration or time lag for rating actions like X number of days or months under ACRA or elsewhere? I think it's more related to the methodology where, uh, like, like, uh, like I said, uh, um, uh, like in, in Sri Lanka, which comes in Ghana also to me, where the, uh, the, the implication, we have not yet discussed the implication of the write down or uh, the write off of the government debt for the local banks, which hold most of it. Like in Sri Lanka, if 50% written off, the banks will become very weak. And uh, it will, it can do a kind of a systemic risk within the within the jurisdiction, and then maybe we have to de-link our triple A ratings and the corporates. But Sharma was of the other opinion, but that was a different point. I was talking about where the uh, the, uh, the the corporate ratings are higher than the national scale on the global scale. But we are not talking about the national scale where you anchor your rating to the triple A. And now in Sri Lanka, this is the same thing. How could we have done? I, 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 I am very happy that I'm not inside Sri Lanka right now to do the ratings on the national scale because I would not know. I mean, for my experience in three decades, I don't know how to detach the corporate ratings from the AAA ratings inside Sri Lanka. That was my question. Sharma, can you think about it and how can we resolve it if we are in, inside Sri Lanka? Before uh, we, we respond to your question, Mr. Payne, just to answer the time lag question, obviously the point is that the, the, uh, the time lag should be minimized just enough to be able to process the impact of a certain factor, risk factor developing. Other than that, time lag, the, the less, the better. Uh, so obviously our, uh, our skill is and our utility to the markets is in, is in being able to uh, communicate at the right time, as soon as we, we have been able to process the impact correctly, we should be issuing it in the market. So the ratings are forward looking. So the latest information as of last hour has to be incorporated. So uh, there is virtually supposed to be no time lag, uh, conceptually speaking at least, just what is mechanics, mechanistically required. It means when Sri Lanka um, uh, wrote down its, uh, 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 debt and uh, the instruments. So it means we would have taken it to D, right? The national scale at D, then would, what would happen to the rest of the, the ratings, the corporate and the banks within, within that jurisdiction, the national scale ratings? That is that, I will let Sharma. Yes. Ask. So what I think is that uh, even if suppose uh, uh, the sovereign defaults, now it, it will have a major impact, but the impact on a specific corporate on the national scale will again vary from a corporate to corporate. There can be corporates whose balance sheets could be so strong and whose business risk profile would be so strong that they would be able to manage even such a situation. And so obviously some of those entities would be able to absorb even such a shock on the national scale in terms of their rating. But if there are corporates uh, who are significantly leveraged, they are dependent on the banking sector in terms of borrowings and, the, and maybe the large banks in that country, uh, they default and they go down, then obviously uh, that will have a cascading impact on the, uh, on the business profile of such weaker or moderate entities and which will ha definitely have then an impact on its ratings. 
but there will be a section of corporates which are significantly large, sig have significant market share, strong business profile, and a very strong balance sheet, not overtly leveraged, low leverage, and they will be able to survive even such a shock. That is what I feel. As, as a discussion point, as a reaction to your point, I believe that the financial sector is always very vulnerable to the government actions, not the corporates. Because some right. of the corporates, you said, like Apple, it's yes. a triple Still, it maintains a triple A position and it's widespread, right? Got but it. the bank can have a contagion effect, even if it's a written down, like, like we saw in a Republican bank, uh, they could not go out and have a $4 billion um, treasury because the interest rates were hiking, they were hiking and they had a loss on the treasury. So uh, I think we only have a minute. If somebody can have a, maybe Oscar can have a, uh, on the Turkey, because Turkey is very important. If you look at, it's a free float. The people come in, go out, and uh, so how do uh, he, how does he feel about uh, what is impending in 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 the near future about the Turkey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sure. And just to perhaps echo the last uh, points as well. I think in case of a sovereign default on such a scale, what matters is maybe the accounting identity, right? The government writing of that is equal to whoever is holding this that as an asset writing of this asset and in turkey's case 77 percent of domestic government debt is owned by the banks so uh it's a closed system in that case and currently uh, what we have is in fact today we have in four hours the mpc decision by the central bank so they will probably raise rates a little bit more uh, but in Turkey, I think it's a very good example to this because we have, we do not have a single too big to fail bank, but our banking system is very much interconnected at the moment. And, and I, what I mean is state banks are a big part of it, but also the central bank is lying at the heart of the system and is providing liquidity to all of the banks. So if the central bank and the treasury is borrowing and then offering these supporting uh, loans and payments, so we do not have a single bank, but we have a whole of an interconnected system. So they all work in tandem. Uh, and ultimately, if there was a risk to surface, I think it would not just come from a single bank in Turkey's case, but that would be more like a regulator, like a more sovereign level issue. And at the moment, so I think uh, we're doing fine on that regard, but this is an uh, this is a difficult task for rating agency I have it. and especially in, in our case since we are the national rating agency like offering ratings to all of the corporates we always have to consider uh, how the government will react to any risk coming up thank you very much everybody Thanks for the last session. So our next stream is commercial banks, and the topic is uh, addressing evolving systematic systemic risk scenarios in the banking system. Presented by Oliver Hoffman, ABA Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Head of Asia at Erste Group Bank, Hong Kong branch. Oliver started his banking career in 1987 with Deutsche Bank in his native country, Germany, and in 89, 1989 joined Brescia Berenice Bank, uh, which is now Unicredit Bank. And Oliver had various senior positions in Unicredit Bank, as well as directorships in various bank subsidiaries in Hong Kong, mainly in China and Taiwan. Oliver holds a degree in banking and in business administration and economics, and is an alumni of the Pacific Rim Bankers Program. He's married with two children, so the, uh, as usual, the, the QA session will be after Oliver's uh, presentation, uh, uh, after he's finished his, his, uh, his topic. Uh, and then please enter your questions in the chat box. Oliver, you may start your uh, topic, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rachan, for the kind introduction. And, and thank you uh, to the ABA and the ACRA uh, for, for having me today. Uh, let me just share my screen uh, with you. 
So as uh, Rajan mentioned, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here today to give you, um, say, the commercial bankers uh, view on the topic. We have, uh, we obviously mm -hmm. have had the colleagues from the rating agencies. We will have uh, regulators uh, after this session. Um, so I'll try to give you uh, the, the, the practitioners uh, a few on the topic on, on systemic uh, risk. Uh, let's see. No, oh, sorry. So as um, Sabine in her, in her presentation uh, already gave a, a very good description of, of systemic risk per se, uh, by definition, there is systemic risk uh, in, in, in other systems too, but it is especially pronounced, I would say, in, 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 in the banking system. There are reasons for this which have to do with, with uh, the key features um, of our business. And two of the most important, in my view, are those two which I um, uh, highlighted here in bold. Um, that is confidence and trust and, and interconnectedness. Trust, of course, is, is the base for, for any um, economic transaction, but you will need it to be at an especially high level for other people to let you deal with their money. Uh, once a bank loses the trust of its clients um, and the wider markets, um, it, it really it doesn't matter how strong your business model really is um, or, or, uh, or how valuable your assets are. Basically, if you, if you lose the trust of the market, uh, you're done. It, it's, it's very, very difficult to uh, recover from that. What adds to that in, in more recent times is that, that bad news that erode trust, be they, be they true or false, they spread much, much more faster uh, than in, in the past, mainly through uh, social media. And your customers now, they, they don't need to come to your counters or ATMs first to withdraw their money. They can do that with three or four clicks uh, on their mobile phone. So it's, it's much more difficult now, I think, to, to manage this because it all happens much faster and at a, at a, at a much larger scale. Um, the other... Uh, special and very important feature is um, how deeply banks are interconnected with each other and, and how much we depend on each other, much more than the players in other industry. Uh, if, if you, for example, have a, a, a car company failing, that will not have an immediate negative effect on, um, on other car companies, or maybe <clears throat> rather a positive one because they have one uh, one competitor less, it will not bring down the whole car industry. Uh, however, if a bank fails, there is an immediate negative effect on almost all other banks, uh, at least those banks in the same market. We are all connected through bilateral payment obligations, through securities holdings, uh, securities settlement, derivatives exposure. And again, if, if the bank fails in your own, in your home country, um, you will have to shoulder the payout under the deposit uh, insurance fund together with the other uh, surviving banks. Plus, and this brings us again back to the, to the trust uh, point, there's a real danger that when there is one bank run, that this will lead to an overall loss of trust in the system uh, and thus spread to other banks. The other uh, apart or apart from those two two aspects, of course, uh, banks have a crucial role for the working of an economy overall. I put this down here as financial intermediation, i.e., that's the channeling of funds between savers and borrowers, and providing liquidity and and credit availability. So these three main factors basically are the reason why uh, regulatory compliance is even more important in the banking sector than in, in other industries. Uh, I think I can say for, for, for us bankers, uh, it's, not, it's not our favorite activity um, or the most popular activity, but of course we see it is absolutely crucial for ensuring the, the safety and 
the soundness of the system. Again, always coming back to the trust issue. And to be very blunt, if you do not, as a bank, if you do not follow the, the state regulations, I think you also should not be entitled to state support when, when things get really bad. That, of course, is, is, is a different story, but uh, we, we, may, uh, we can talk about that later. So uh, in a bank, how do you, how do you measure uh, systemic risk? There's a whole host of risks that have to be looked at, and uh, I, I put uh, down some here on, on, on the slide. Uh, and I'd like to give you an example of how this is dealt with um, within the European uh, banking system. So the approach of uh, the ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, was to set up an entity called the European Systemic Risk Board. This happened in, in 2010 uh, with the purpose of uh, to, to oversee the financial system of the EU and specifically uh, prevent and mitigate uh, systemic risk. The ESRB is, is chaired by, by the president of the ECB, Madame Lagarde, uh, and it has a, a number of committees and task forces headed by members of the EU's national central banks and financial supervisory uh, agencies. They regularly issue uh, reports, and, and one of the most useful references also for us banks is the uh, ESRB risk dashboard from which I took this graph. This is the composite indicator of systemic stress. And that indicator derives from looking into the various risk categories for banks, which are listed um, on, on the previous slide. I have put together some um, examples for you within these risk categories. Um, and I mean, the data here is obviously derived from, from what we report uh, to, to the ECB. So for example, here you have the, uh, the interconnectedness risk or interlinkages risk, as they call it here. Um, for each risk, the ESRB look uh, at, a, at a number of indicators. And one of the examples for the interconnectedness um, uh, risk are the bilateral claims bank have on each other within the EU. Um, that's represented here by the, by the bubbles and by the, uh, by the arrows. Um, another risk, of course, to look at is the macro uh, risk. An example here is to look at the debt to GDP ratio among EU countries. Uh, US a bank, of course, are, are mainly concerned with, with uh, with the ratio for your home market. Um, for credit risk, for example, uh, you can look at the development of, of the spreads over corporate bonds. Funding and liquidity, very, very important for banks. Uh, one one uh, uh, indicator to look at are the spreads on interbank borrowings. For market risk, of course, a very wide field, you can look um, at, at the development of the exchange rate of your home currency against other major currencies. Again, I, I show you here just one example. Actually, the dashboard has, I think, at least five to 10 um, components for, for each risk. Profitability and solvency. Here, the graphs show you the range uh, observed among all the banks reporting. The white, the thin white line you see here uh, that is uh, that is the average for banks. Um, another risk, structural risk. Um, for example, you look at how large is the banking sector of your country and how much of that is controlled by foreign entities. These foreign entities, in if 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 things turn bad, either in your market or in their home market or in both. Um, these foreign entities, of course, may or may not stay uh, in your country, and if they leave, may take uh, their money and their lending with them. And um, as, as a last example here, um, the role of central count, uh, central clearing counterparties or clearing houses has become much more important uh, in, in, in the recent times, and with that also the risk associated with 
uh, associated with, uh, with them. So, for example, you look at how much of, of the margin contribution, the default fund, and the client clearing at a given CCP is concentrated within uh, or among the five largest clearing members. So these are just um, some examples what to look at. You can add to that list and it keeps evolving in line with what happens in the real world. So that already brings me to the last slide of my presentation. Uh, I put down some I'd say, real life examples and maybe then also some points later for the discussion. Um, those of you who, who, like me, have been around for a while in banking, they will remember two classic examples um, of uh, systemic risk in the banking sector, uh, which were part of the big financial crisis in 2007-2008, that of course were um, Lehman Brothers and AIG. Plus, you may add, it's not on the list here, but you may add as an example for the breakdown of a whole banking system, the, the, the banking system in Iceland in, in, in uh, 2008-2009. Um, as a direct consequence of these cases, um, you had the Dodd-Frank Act uh, introduced in 2010 with, uh, with a new very tight uh, set of regulations to limit systemic risk. You, you had adjustments made to the Basel uh, rules and specifically in Europe, uh, we had the, what is called the minimum requirement for own funds and eligible liabilities, the so-called MREL uh, uh, regulation introduced in 2016 as part of the uh, Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, which again, speaking from a banker's point of view, requires us to, to issue Bailey Neville paper with, let's say, very little economic benefit for us. We had two more recent cases, obviously, with, uh, with uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, and, and, and Credit uh, Suisse. Uh, and some people start talking about, or Christine also elaborated in that on that, on a major crisis uh, emanating from China. Uh, spe specifically with regards to the local government finance vehicles that I put a question mark behind, um, or I should put one behind Silicon Valley Bank in China. The first, because I'm not so sure how systemic relevant uh, the first one really was. And the second, because I think China is, um, is a little different and it's, it's probably too early to tell yet. So that is what I have in my presentation. Um, the biggest risk for me now, of course, is getting difficult questions from Rajan. So one of the things that I think that I would like to know is that looking ahead, what developments do you see uh, increasing or decreasing systemic risk among, among banks? Yeah, I think, um, of course, uh, one one development we're watching very closely here is what happens in the fintech uh, space. Uh, I mean, for us as banks, these are these are on the one hand they are competitors. Uh, we have to watch very closely. There's, it's it's quite a disruption, especially say in in, in the payments uh, area. That that is a, a definite a concern for our business. At the same time. They also bring in a lot of new ideas, good ideas. They show how much more effective and how much cheaper you can you can provide services than old banks do. So that is a disruption that that the, the let's say the traditional banking system will will have to deal with um, either by uh, improving their own game or by, by teaming up with uh, with some of these new players. Um, we also have. Um, the, the topic of cryptocurrencies, that's, again, I think the, the absolute number of people using cryptocurrencies still is, is, is small, but it is, it is growing and, and we have also a generational change here. Um, that is something we as banks have to look at. Of course, it's also an issue for the, for the regulators, how to regulate uh, these two new areas. Um, some of the developments in 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 Europe at the moment. Um, one of one of my colleagues always says the the biggest systemic risk for for us banks are our politicians. 
So if uh, I, I think they, the, the banks in, in Europe had two very good years, that's true. They made tremendous, or most of the banks, let's say, made, made very large profits. As a, um, as a responsible institution, of course, the, the, the correct thing is to do to use past part of these profits to put them aside, to strengthen your, your capital base, to strengthen your defenses. But it's of course um, it's of course harder to do that when your government comes around the corner and says, "Oh, you, we think you made too much profit, so we'll introduce a, a, a bank tax, a special bank tax, which will take away uh, some of your profits." But at the same time, the regulatory requirements keep um, keep being uh, increased. Right. Just one more adding to that. Do you think there is a, what about AI with artificial intelligence? Is that something contributing towards systemic risk or will it be able to solve some of the systemic risks that you sort of <laughs> highlighted earlier? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I think uh, it's it's both, but I, I look more on the positive side. I, I for example, there are some, some projects underway at the moment uh, that use AI for example, in the sanctions check or in the AM, uh, AML check uh, procedures, which are, if you do them by hand, or so you need an army of people to do that. It's it's very uh, labor intensive. It's 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 costly. It's slow. So to use AI uh, in um, in this field is, uh, I think that would 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 be a, a great advantage and to 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 simplify things for us to to make it more efficient and thus also lower the risk that that uh, that uh, we have in in that area great so we have a question from zahid ahmed um, he's commenting that interesting information and dashboard shared looks like very close monitoring the best part is that that there is a regulator behind to support but still can avoid the events. Does this give give us a comfort to the bank that there is a big brother behind them? Um, no, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I mean, as I, as I said, <laughs> um, we operate in a highly regulated industry, and there is a reason why this is highly regulated because you're dealing with with the money of other people. You the People trust you with their money, with, with the planning for for the retirement or what, what you have not. So, I I think it's 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 justified. Obviously, we're not always happy with with what what the regulators requires from us. We think some uh, some regulations could be more uh, a, a, a bit too remote from reality. What we face in our in our business, but overall. Um, if you want to, if you want to operate in banking, I think you, you have to accept this and it, it makes absolute sense. Okay. Uh, and, uh, from Kanchana, uh, would you agree that there was an accounting treatment issue as well as with respect to SVP, SVB collapse? Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, what SVB triggered, and we see that, um, for example, also now here in here in Hong Kong, by by requests we, we receive from the regulator, they are now much more closely looking at the the bond holdings of of the banks, especially the bonds you hold in what is called the hold to maturity uh, portfolio. So these are booked at at amortized cost and are are not mark to market on a, on a, on a daily basis. But you obviously will have to look at the uh, the book value and the fair value of these bonds, uh, there may be quite quite a difference. You show them on your balance sheet with the book value, but further down in the uh, in the notes, you you somewhere mentioned the the fair value that that escaped the attention of a lot of people in 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 the past. So I I do think that SVB has 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 cast a spotlight on certain accounting uh, issues in the banks. Yes. Right. Um, so, Oliver, you know, going back to your last slide uh, with the real life examples, and uh, uh, are you able to walk us through where you see the difference between uh, historic 
and more recent cases? Um, yeah, I think I think uh, the the main difference here is for 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 Lehman Brothers uh, and and EIG. <laughs> It's a proof that they were a systemic risk, and and the proof is the the um, uh, the crisis that uh, that followed them. I mean, Lehman Brothers when they failed, they were the the fourth largest investment bank in in the U.S. AIG is was a one of the largest insurance companies in the world. They had more than one trillion U.S. dollar in in, in assets. So those two cases, I accept that those were um, real crisis cases um again if you think back at the time it's 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 now what 16 16 years ago which doesn't which doesn't seem that long ago but at that time um i was working for for, for one of the larger european banks lehman was a, a major counterpart of us it took us weeks or maybe even months to establish what our real exposure to Lehman Brothers was across across the whole group. So back then, the whole risk management, the counterparty management, the uh, the reporting systems were much less or or not developed, right? So so mm -hmm. uh, it was much more difficult back then to really evaluate and quantify uh, your risk and take the um, take the necessary measures back then. Also. Uh, I, I would say news traveled much uh, slower. You know, the iPhone was came out when 2007. So you had one year after the iPhone came out, there were not that many smartphones around. So you would get your information. Well, you had logged onto your PC or you read newspaper, you mm -hmm. watched the TV. So it, it was slower and more difficult to 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 get information. So the whole uh, reaction time was 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 also delayed. Um, some I don't know if you remember. Some people seem to uh, also be living on the other side of the moon. You have KFW paying 300 million euros to Lehman Brothers the day they um, they went bankrupt or filed for bankruptcy. So things like that happened back then. And I think from there to now, we we made huge progress. I mean, not not only as banks, but the whole environment also. Uh, in, in, in terms of regulation, in terms of, of the availability of information, the granularity of information you can get now. So I hope at least we are, we are better now in identifying and, and reacting to crises. For, mm -hmm. for Silicon Valley Bank, I, I don't know. I don't know how, how systemic relevant that really was. I, I hope my, my American friends won't, won't mind saying me that, but Whatever happens in the U.S. seems to be more dramatic than elsewhere. I think if a, if if a bank of that size and uh, specialized like this would have failed in Europe or in here in Asia, uh, I don't think that would have created that much excitement. And uh, for China, I mean, Christine covered this covered this very well already. I think the the, the numbers are mind boggling. I think the official uh, a local government debt number is, is 5 trillion US dollars, but then you have this, what they call the hidden debt, maybe another 5 trillion. So you're looking at 10 trillion uh, US dollars debt. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's a crazy number. At the same time, I think uh, what, what you should not forget is that uh, in China, it's Chinese entities owing mm. to other Chinese entities within China. So the the uh, overseas debt you can it's not neglectable but compared to the domestic debt it's uh it, it's it's smaller much much smaller so and the domestic debt i still believe the chinese government being a command economy uh they have uh methods and 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 ways to deal with it which which would not be possible or maybe not effective in let's say a free market economy so again, we are. I, I do worry <laughs> about these numbers, but we still have uh, uh, confidence that this will be that this will be settled within China. Thanks for that, uh, Oliver. So, what standard mechanism can be used to compensate bond losses at uh, at the U.S. Treasury yield as the uh, U.S. Treasury yields go up? So, so I say again, I didn't. 
Oh, basically, what standard mechanisms can be used to compensate bond losses as the U.S. Treasury's yield go up? Okay, it depends on. I mean, if you don't have to, if you don't have to sell the bond, um, mm -hmm. if you can hold it to maturity and it's a good credit risk like a U.S. Treasury, you will assume that it will be repaid at at one hundred percent. So you may have during the lifetime of the bond, you have these volatility and and let's say paper losses which if you book them uh, fair value through pnl you have to show them in your pnl but over mm -hmm. the lifetime of the investment it will it, it will come back and it will be repaid at par so i think it's 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 really important to look at the credit quality uh, of these bonds and as long as you you have the luxury to be able to hold them until maturity, I don't think you would be too worried. Plus, for example, uh, in in our bank, we obviously we hold a lot of um, very high grade uh, bond paper, and that paper is eligible for repos with the central bank. So, in case you need really need to to uh, raise cash or liquidity, you can repo these bonds mm -hmm. with the ECB without selling them, and then. Uh, create the cash, solve your cash issue, and, and then get back the bond at the end of the repo deal. I think uh, there is a question as well. What triggers bond losses? <laughs> well, many, <laughs> many things. Many right? things. Yeah, there is. But uh, I thought I'd just ask. <laughs> the last few weeks of, of or month was, of course, the, the the rate increases by by the Fed and by the ECB. Um, yeah, you have overall market events. I mean, the, yeah, the bond loss looking at it. In, 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 in China for, for Evergrande or Country Garden, that's obviously because of the existential problems they have. Yeah. That's a credit problem. So, yeah, many things. <laughs> so, uh, one more question here. How do we minimize the system risk, uh, systemic risk costing in the banking sector? Essentially, minimizing systemic risk costings. Uh, I think, um, yeah, you you already alluded to in in one of the previous questions. Um, yeah. I think the use of AI can can yeah. really uh, make us more efficient, save us cost and 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 manpower. Um, it's it's difficult because on the one hand side we have the uh, Obviously, the cost pressure from from our from from management or from the shareholders want us to to uh, perform can keep a, a cost income ratio if possible at fifty percent or or, be, or below. Um, so we're doing all we can here, but at the same time, the um, the regulatory requirements keep keep going up, keep adding up. So it's yeah, it's uh, I don't really see. A lot of um, opportunities to save cost here, unless we we use a modern technology like AI or, or or blockchain for that matter. Will it will it bring uh, fast and real time visibility? Yeah, there's um, like for example in trade finance business, they um, they, they started to use a, a blockchain that obviously is again, will make things uh, more efficient and, and, and more transparent. Um, that's, that's all within what I call the uh, technical advancement. Definitely, yes, will, uh, will, will make us more efficient, will probably will, will lower the cost per transaction. At the same time, you will have initial setup cost. You will need to invest uh, also to upgrade your systems. You will need Probably you will need to look for for different people, right? Who have mm. different understanding uh, outside of of uh, traditional banking. So the the immediate immediately the immediate effect will be um, probably a cost increase long term should bring down the cost. Okay, we have a a question anonymous Cindy. Uh, Generally, the focus is on operational credit and market risks. But apart from that, what are the other emerging risks you see, especially in the developing economies? That's true. There is 
quite a number also, how shall I put it, of intangible uh, risks mm -hmm. here. So uh, I, I think I alluded to, to that several times in my presentation. It's, it's I, we call it trust, but you also can say uh, it's the reputational risk. So I think modern bank customers take, uh, or let's say younger bank customers, maybe they take much more interest in, uh, for example, what do you do in in the ESG space? Are you are you a, a environmentally and socially responsible uh, enterprise? So, if you neglect that space, maybe in the past that that that, that didn't have that many consequences. But with with a generation where where, where these uh, aspects be, is is becoming more and more important now, that also is. Is 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 uh, is a topic for the bank, not only in, in the advanced economies, but also in in the developing countries. I think this is really international um, trend and phenomenon. The banks banks will will have to deal with, and you have to take that that very seriously because these are your your clients of of tomorrow. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, there is digital trust risk associated with digital trust. Basically means that you know protecting or protecting uh, customer credentials at every digital uh, footprint, and uh, yeah. you know, and that also is associated with the reputational risk on both sides, whether it's a retail, a uh, customer-wise, or as well as the institution and banks. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any comments on that? I mean, what we what we see here is uh, there is the trend for for open banking, so that yeah. will. You allow, as a client, you allow a service provider to to basically uh, take um, your client data from from if you have accounts with different banks to take this from these banks and aggregate it and uh, uh, let's say um, prepare it for your for your planning or for for your oversight, which. I think that's it, it, it's a good development. It's your data as a client, and you want to 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 have the say how that is managed, who who you give access to that. Of course, in doing that, that also increases the risk for leaks, right? If you have it, if mm -hmm. it's between you and your bank, okay, the bank is 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 you have only have two risks yourself <laughs> in your PC and and the bank in its systems. But in 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 open banking, that of course multiplies the the risk. The more your data is shared with uh, with other providers, I I don't think we can uh, prevent that. Also, and again, it's it's the client wants that, but it it does increase the risk specifically to with regards to data leaks and and data privacy. I think uh, we. Hang on, there's one more. So uh, there's, uh, you focused on digitization and AI. Do you see any digital risk emer emerging in, in days ahead? I think you covered it already. Yeah, that's just what, what yeah. we mentioned. And then of course the, yeah. um, I mean, what's possible now by, by using just small, maybe we are being recorded now, somebody uses our voice clips uh, yeah. to, to create a fake, um, uh, clip uh, with us so it's uh, again it's there's a lot of opportunities but equal equal um, dangers here um, you have anything else to say uh, before we wrap this up no I think I said enough <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so as well thank you, uh, thank you very uh, much this was a long uh, session for, for and, moderating uh, this yeah and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah uh, thanks to the ABA for the organization Yes, and uh, th thanks for everybody who has asked questions and uh, thanks for your patience. Good afternoon to all our colleagues in, the, in APRA and ABBA. This is uh, part three, session three of our conference and we shall be addressing evolving systemic risks uh, focused on the role of a central bank. I would like to introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Johnny Noe Iravalo, 
He is uh, the senior assistant governor for the Office of uh, Systemic Risk Management in Banco Central ng Pilipinas, which is our Philippines Central Bank. Uh, Dr. Ravalo holds a uh, very sensitive position because he is a principal watchman for any systemic risks looming in the horizon. On his uh, predictive analysis of evolving events covering a wide geographical area depends vital anticipatory decisions of uh, regulatory interventions. So let's get to know how Dr. Ravlo goes, dis goes about discharging his, uh, well, uh, very heavy responsibilities. My pleasure to introduce and present Dr. Johnny Noe E. Ravalo. Thank you very much, uh, Santi, and good afternoon, everybody from uh, from here in the Philippines. Um, um, I thought I would uh, start my uh, presentation with a very short video, uh, which we ran in a conference, international conference, a few months back. I thought it would give us a little bit more of a uh, benchmark of what we will discuss. And from there, I'll, I'll take it back to screen. So if I may ask uh, my colleague, Joan, to please play the video, it's just around two minutes. The term macroprudential has come to common use among financial authorities. Coined in 1979, it is a portmanteau that reflects the desire to avoid adverse macroeconomic outcomes by molding risk behaviors. But then, the world entered the period of the Great Moderation. For over two decades, economic growth was steady and inflation was moderate. Many saw the Great Moderation as the resounding proof that the boom and bust cycle had been solved. A strong macroeconomy was the key, and financial market oversight is simply an appendage of managing the macroeconomy. Then came the global financial crisis, a complete shock coming from decades of the Great Moderation. More than the speed and extent of dislocations, the GFC challenged the conventional thinking. What did we really learn from the GFC? In a word, it is contagion, and what drives this? We now see financial systems as a network of interconnected stakeholders. Their time-sensitive decisions create channels of risks along a path that changes with time and market conditions. But system-level risks are shape-shifters because those making choices learn from experience. They adapt as much as adopt. The reforms out of the GFC were all about understanding why system-level risks are different from institution-level risks. This is the context of what is now our pursuit of financial stability. It is about managing systemic risks different from the health of a bank or managing inflation. Yet, it took more than a decade before the world could truly assess how we fared in remodeling the financial market architecture. COVID-19 was a macroeconomic shock that had profound financial market consequences. It was a systemic risk, a global one at that. As the world was coming out of the pandemic, high inflation became the latest systemic shock. The difference though is that we are shape-shifting again from the lower for longer interest rate environment to a higher for now market situation. It is a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous financial world. Arguably, it has gotten more VUCA. It is because of this that there is an increasing need for macroprudential measures, molding risk behaviors that have system level outcomes that are difficult to anticipate. Looking ahead, uncertainty is the baseline. How then does Asia respond? Can it provide solutions for the region when much of the problems may be from other parts of the world? Does Asia have a voice in crafting the way forward for Asia and for the global economy? 
managing systemic risks is a frontier field, but it is the field that defines what happens to us collectively and as individual jurisdictions. There is but one global economy, whose whole is more than the sum of its parts. Let us all be part of a common solution. This starts with each of us under a shared vision for the common good of a better future for all stakeholders. Manage systemic risks now, our future, as much as our today, depends on it. I hope that uh, it gave everybody a two-minute video uh, portal of what I really wanted to talk about. In many respects, the previous speakers have touched on the key thoughts. Oliver talked about uh, interconnectedness. Uh, Matsuda-san talked about digitization. Eugene talked about the, uh, the new risks from uh, risk-free assets called treasuries. We talked about uh, through the cycle uh, versus uh, turning points type of discussions. So many of the issues have really been talked about. But uh, if I may share now my uh, PowerPoint, please. Uh, the gist of all of this is that everyone now talks about macroprudential policy. Um, everyone talks about systemicness and systemic risks. But I will take the view that over the last 12 years, uh, since uh, the turn of the decade after the GFC and into the European debt crisis, much still remains to be understood. And there's much confusion about what it is and what it is not. So we run through the video. I'll spend most of my slides on why, what we think is systemic risk and what it, why it matters to us. I have a few slides on the potential growing risks, and I'll top it off with the uh, challenges of execution. It was mentioned by, uh, I think it was Sabine who talked about the JFC as being a central uh, turning point, and certainly we fully agree. Uh, the, the issue of systemicness in macroprudential policy really goes all the way back to the 70s. But as the video showed, because of the great moderation, nobody paid particular attention to it, even though in the halls of the BIS, there's already a lot of discussion of what is this new phenomenon where we would like to control the prudential uh, behaviors of banks, which have actually macroeconomic consequences rather than microeconomic consequences. So what the GFC did was to change the narrative. At the macro level, the, the, moderate, the great moderation argued that if the macro economy was in good shape, then the financial market must be in good shape as well. The GFC simply showed that's not true. You can have financial market uh, shocks and difficulties separate and distinct from the macro economy. Eventually, they will react to each other anyway. But uh, one is not necessarily uh, co-integrated with the other. At the micro level, and I, I'll have a few slides to talk about this micro level, it turns out that uh, what may be good, what may be best for micro institutions uh, as, they, as they pursue their own best interests, collectively, it may not be good for society as a whole. So what is good for society may not be so popular for the banks or for the non-banks or for that matter, the non-financial corporates and what might be uh, good for the uh, individual stakeholders might be actually detrimental for the banks, for the economy as a whole, right? Let me do a little bit of an experiment. I did a midnight uh, search of the word risk. And you notice that there are 24 million hits and you run through them. And the internet certainly has a lot of things to say about risks. I then try to Google systemic risk. And you see that 97% of that 24 million disappears. Out of the 772,000 hits, many of that are false hits. You will get discussions about systematic risk or your systemic risk to your personal finance or systemic risk in terms of individual firms, but not of the system as a whole. 
So it turns out that uh, Mr. Google, uh, though still has a lot of hits uh, for systemic risk uh, search, really it's not very clear what it is uh, talking about. We do know that there are celebrated cases of systemicness. COVID is a very easy example. This is a case where the risk starts from the macroeconomy, a public health issue, eventually hitting the financial market. This is a risk to the financial market. This is a chart where uh, several global banks that you've read in the newspaper uh, actually reported very high set one ratios. When the global norm is at 4.5 and all of these five banks actually were closed. So this is a case where uh, individual institutions actually show that they have uh, regulatory indicators that do well, but it has not prevented a closure of the banks or the eventual um, shock that their closure created on the market. And finally, I wanted to go back to the taper tantrum. It took one sentence from a statement for the markets to react. And you can see the slightly shaded portion in the middle, where as a result of that one statement, uh, market yields actually climbed significantly. And it took a long time for those yields to actually fall. The question to ask is, is systemic risk an issue only under stress conditions? And the first point I wanted to share with you is the what I wanted to share with you is, right now, I don't know what time you're in right now. What's the, what's your, what's the time you're in? Um, is there, is there a question I, I can hear? Uh -huh. uh, let me proceed then. Uh, there is a formal definition uh, that is provided by a paper from the Financial Stability Board, uh, IMF and BIS. This was penned in 19, 2009 as a result of the GFC. And this was a technical paper that was used as a basis for crafting all of the um, the uh, regulatory changes, the changes in the the landscape, so to speak, the the Basel III Accord and and other related uh, interventions, and two things I wanted to highlight in the definition. The first point is it does not require that the entire system collapses. You can have systemic risk even if only a part of the financial system is in disarray. And the next slide will actually show you why. And the other requirement is for it to be systemic, it must have an adverse impact on the rest of the economy. So uh, closing a bank, any bank, does not necessarily make it systemic. And in, there are many systemic risk issues that have nothing to do with inflation or growth. You can also have systemic issues with private corporations. You can have issues with non-bank financial institutions. So at the end of the day, systemic risk is really about risk and resilience. You want to be able to consider what can be what can cause vulnerabilities to the system and in fact by the system itself, meaning internally generated risks among financial players, not just externally generated risks affecting the financial market. But just like a question of good health, it is also a question of resilience. Even in good times, you should be worried about what it is that we can do to make sure that if something happens, we are better equipped at withstanding all of this vulnerability. So the P word that I will use is really one of preemptiveness. You do not want to do this in the midst of a crisis. You want to be able to prepare yourself beforehand. Now, what exactly should we prepare? In the area of systemic risk, what is really important are the four Cs, connectedness, contagion, complementarities, and correlation. So we end up doing a lot of these network models, a schematic of which you can see on chart. Everyone is related to everybody, either by business connection, uh, by prices, by transaction, 
however it is modeled. And then we draw the linkages so we can tell you if firm one, two, three uh, goes down, who gets affected next? Who's, who are the first round agent zeros? Who would be the second round effect? And eventually who gets affected last until the system actually breaks down. So uh, we do this for many cases, for the banks, for the economy, for the firms across country. So we've done this for, let's say, the, the potential effect of the uh, crisis in Ukraine on their financial markets and the transmission to the rest of the world in terms of the oil and the wheat market. So network models are, are done extensively in this area. And just to make the point uh, about macro potential policy and how it relates to the um, other policy interventions, I, I realized that uh, uh, Oliver mentioned in the prior session that sometimes we do policies that may be disjoint from market realities. Uh, and there was also mention about better communication. Uh, maybe we can do a better job in communicating exactly uh, what we mean and how we mean these policies to interact. But from the point of view of macroprudential policy, it's not standalone. It has a distinct interconnectedness with all other policy issues. And this is a chart from an IMF paper in 2016, and we, we uh, take a look at this uh, uh, quite seriously. I mentioned uh, that I would go back to the question of why is it uh, an issue of connectedness? And let me just uh, put this uh, graph on screen. Imagine an industry of 17 banks. When you take a look at the industry figures, uh, what is normally done is the balance sheets of the 17 banks are added together. So you'll have a total assets, total liabilities, total capital, total deposits. Then you can calculate your capital adequacy ratios, LCR for the individual banks and as well as for the, in, uh, for the system as a whole. You can do it that way, but we choose to do it this way. We know that there are there is a certain bank which is colored in red, that affects um, about nine other banks that are colored in yellow. And those nine banks also affect the rest of the seven other banks that are colored in green. So we can actually map the relationships of the 17 banks who are uh, spreaders, who are asymptotic spreaders, much like COVID, and who are simple receivers of shock but don't pass it on. This, in our view, is a very important uh, insight for purposes of trying to make uh, interventions. And what is the point of the intervention? I'll get back to that on my closing slide, but the very point of macroprudential intervention to mitigate systemic risk is precisely to mold risk behaviors to desired outcomes. So let me then uh, try to wrap it up with uh, some issues for today. Let me highlight three points. We talk about uh, higher for now interest rate environment. The issue really is not just the level, but the swing. The swing from lower for longer, and then the swing to higher for now. So you have a sorry. So you have a situation where interest rates have stretched the asset values going down, and going up, you have mark to market losses. So your first issue is asset valuation. When you do asset valuation, please remember that we're as, as a community of financial market uh, stakeholders, we have to think of this as marking to market. So the reference is a market. And, and therefore the question of uh, individual valuation, do you, how do you use the yield curve? How do you translate that to valuation? How do you uh, use spot rates uh, in the context of individual bonds and in the context of portfolios. That that question, uh, I think, uh, uh, should be revisited in the context of the volatilities in the market. Uh, not everyone will be uh, affected the same way, depending on whether you put a ton of your portfolio in uh, 
HTMs or you, you've taken the risk and you still hold on to available for sale or hold for hold to for trading and so forth and so on. The second obvious issue is debt service. Interest rates higher means it's more costly to manage a, a debt. The question though is, um, while this is re normally reported in the US, I, I just saw a report this morning about the number of uh, closure term level closures and it has already surpassed uh, recent years total. Uh, how come we don't really hear of that too much in Asia? Uh, is there something peculiar about the balance sheet of firms in Asia or is it a question of regulatory relief? Or is, that, is there a, a, a protective measure that is being undertaken so that all of these uh, defensive moves uh, are strengthened? The third is as, as, as uh, the market swung from lower for longer to higher for now, you notice across jurisdictions a buildup of sovereign debt, government securities, essentially increase. So there is this question about how much and who's holding on to those debt. There is now a nexus between sovereign debt and the holders of those debt as those debts are revalued at higher interest rates. And finally, this issue of regulatory measures. Uh, for most jurisdictions, the relief measures have already expired and there is this uh, uh, discussion about whether there will be some long-term implications for the relief measure. The second point I wish to highlight is global value chains. All of us, all of us who, are, who, gone, who went through economic courses were always told that there is this magic of Adam Smith invisible hand. The invisible hand is supposed to say that the private sector, the market itself is better able to make decisions on the allocation and the partnerships that are needed to run the economy. And that is certainly an aspiration as, as we talk about, for example, in, in ASEAN, we talk about the ASEAN financial integration framework or the ASEAN banking integration framework uh, or, um, that is uh, ongoing and has been going on for, for a decade now. But as COVID has showed, the same linkages are now uh, the, the measures for connecting ourselves to different countries. So under stress conditions, they also naturally provide a channel for contagion. So much so that you now hear a lot of discussion about uh, foregoing some amount of offshoring and reverting back to onshoring. That will change materially the landscape of economies because if they do less cross-border transaction and do more onshore transaction, Question of cost, question of efficiency, question of availability, manpower, know-how, structural economic patterns all come into play. Finally, I, this is the point of uh, Matsuda-san, this earlier start of the session, digitalization. Um, there's no debate that it, it creates a benefit. But the point that uh, we're making also is that different jurisdictions are structured differently. So the ability of a jurisdiction for a country or a locality as a whole uh, to absorb all of this uh, digital technologies, the ability to, to take advantage of the benefits will also be different from one locality to the other. And therefore the question of safety nets may be more localized rather than globalized. But right now there's, a, there's also this effort to standardize all of this, uh, all of these initiatives, and therefore, this is just a friendly reminder that maybe we need to take a look at more idiosyncratic uh, situations. Um, some key challenges ahead. Just uh, two more, two or three more slides. I, I know I've uh, gone over my my uh, my time limit. Um, first three points. There's really no obvious way for warning against systemic risk. Because if we knew what the systemic risk would look like before it happened, then it would never happen. Because the regulators would take uh, full advantage of the information and take preemptive action. The fact that surprises happen suggests that there is a, a lot of challenges, not just in terms of identifying what may happen, 
but trying to understand the linkages between the agents in the market that will transmit all of those risks. As I had argued earlier, systemic risk certainly means that the final outcome is large. There's going to be a huge displacement, distortions in the market. However, systemic risk does not have to start large. You can have very small shocks that can cascade throughout the system to finally end up with disproportionately large final outcome. The second point is data. We always talk about the incompleteness and imperfection of data. Reality is markets are always asymmetric. People know more than others, and there are some data just you simply do not find. It is a big challenge if we are going to quantify systemic risk. I just don't think it's a deal breaker. There are ways around that. Uh, think of the job as being an archaeologist. Uh, you go out to the desert, you dig, you'll be happy to find a few shards. And the job is to translate the few shards into a vase and talk about what life would have been hundreds of years ago simply by imagining the vase from the shards that you put together. And finally, even if uh, data were complete, the reality is people do change behavior. So this is not like the textbook behaviors that we will revert to our old normal. Um, risk on risk off was invented precisely because market stakeholders do change behaviors. And sometimes if you get, get burnt enough, you don't get, you don't to revert to what you used to be doing in the market. So this is, there is, there is a learning part to all of this. I wanted to add that the communication part, uh, we can certainly raise awareness, but it will require that the stakeholders accept both the gains and limitations of systemic risk analysis before action can be created. But because I know of the risk on risk off type of scenario, and I know that I cannot add balance sheets to form an aggregate level view of the system as a whole, I need to worry about what is called as a fallacy of composition. The fallacy of composition simply means what is good uh, for individual stakeholders taken together may not be good for the system as a whole and vice versa. <laughs> Let me then <clears throat> uh, try to close this. There's a lot of math involved uh, when we do those network models. Uh, they are not the standard models that one gets to go through in college. <clears throat> um, I would argue though, <clears throat> that as difficult as the math may be, what is more difficult is communicating systemic risk. How do you communicate something to make it productive to stakeholders without panicking the market? <clears throat> and that has proven to be particularly a big challenge. Uh, let me then close by this particular chart. There are six things on the screen and as you can see, Aristotle's picture is back on screen. Aristotle famously has argued that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. It's actually a, <clears throat> a misrepresentation of what he wrote. What he wrote is the whole is different from the uh, uh, parts. Uh, so when you think about financial markets, we all have to accept that this is a market of asymmetric information. And I think credit rating agencies and credit ratings in general will qualify for what I will uh, categorize them under financial market infrastructure. You are the guardians of asymmetric information. Not everybody will know everything that they should know. And therefore your contribution is to help them know what they ought to know so that they can make well-informed decisions. We all agree that if agents make ill-informed decision, something will go wrong. And in fact, even if they make well-informed decision, something can still go wrong. So the question of managing information is very central to this financial market. If the point of systemic risk is to mold risk behaviors, those behaviors will only change if there is some understanding, there is some knowledge, there is some behavior opportunity to change, 
before the literacy part actually changes to actual behaviors. I finish with uh, six points on screen. I simply want to remind that uh, financial system is more than the sum of the parts. So there's a lot of things going on going there. You can take a look at banking, but it's not going to be independent of the capital markets of clearing of contingent markets of cash markets. Information is key, but uh, I would argue from my point of view that the value of information is not through the cycle. The value of information is to identify turning points because uh, uh, balance sheets and uh, individual welfares are affected uh, as a result of those turning points. The third bullet simply says that you can't add balance sheets to form the system. There's an aggregation problem. Uh, I don't have time to explain that. Happy to discuss it in the Q&A if there's a question. The fourth simply says, take a look at this as a portfolio. You're not looking at the risk of individual assets. You're looking at the risks of the portfolio and therefore correlations, integrated risks across assets, co-variabilities, co-movement, separate movement, independent movement, all of those matter. The fifth is a technical term. Uh, financial markets is seen as a complex system, not a complicated system, but a complex system. And there is a feature called emergence where there is an output of the system that cannot be seen by looking at the individual parts. And finally, I, I, I finish with um, the fallacy of composition. My last point, uh, and I apologize, Santi, for taking up so, so much time. Oh, um, no, 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 we like it. At the end of the day, if this is about financial market and this is about public, the public saving, this is about investment. So before investors, they used to be savers. So you need to migrate savers into investors. Savers are protect their, their deposits like crazy. There's no valuation issue at all. They will withdraw when they need to. So that's a question of liquidity. But if you start migrating to investors, when you talk about payments, you talk about investment, you talk about uh, uh, particular assets, whether it's GS or uh, what used to be hold to maturity is now part of the uh, Silicon Valley chart presented to the US Congress because they needed to sell hold to, hold to maturity type of assets, then valuation really, really has to matter. I still think that uh, everything that we, we've learned is you have to value it against changing market conditions. That's why it's called marking to market. You do not value securities against individual security. You have to market it against everything else that's going around in the system because that's the very point of substitution effect. I either hold my asset or I get out and do something else. And when you do that, uh, even if you hold your asset, there will be plus and minuses involved. So let me end there. And I, I'm sorry I took up so much time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raulo. Uh, know it. Uh, you don't have to apologize. We need. We wanted. To, we we wanted to listen to you. And I must. I just have to say it. You made a presentation like a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Very well organized, and you uh, you caught. My, you kept my attention all the time. Thank but you. But like a good teacher, you, you have also created me. Uh, generated more questions, so I have become more inquisitive. But one. Pre prescription I'm hearing from all these discussions, uh, not just this one, but the previous ones, is that we have to be in, in constant state of mobilization to handle systemic risks as they descend upon us. Meaning we should have an organized way of mitigating the spread of their risks and their adverse consequences. And that's why central banks like the BSP have uh, this so-called, they call it the systemic risk management framework. And we have that uh, in, the, in, uh, in the BSP. And let me just quote a, a, uh, a paragraph from that framework. The Financial Stability Coordinating Council, that's the 
FDSB should take direct jurisdiction when the consequences are principally macrofinancial in nature. The council should then stem further deterioration with concrete and timely interventions, including a communications campaign that periodically discloses before. but not alarms the public. Yeah, but, uh, but in this age of fast break communications of uh, social media, Viber, Instagram, etc., etc., how can the regulatory authorities effectively control public information that does not alarm? So you want to do it? Yeah. Uh, Jerry, it's, it's, not, it's not just about fast moving news. It's also about fake news that can trigger unwanted panic. Uh, Dr. Ravalo. The answer to your question is you communicate when you don't have to. Because if the market knows that you only talk uh, when there's a problem, then they can smell that there's a crisis that's going to happen. Uh, this, is, uh, this goes to the point earlier of Sabine that uh, you need to intervene, but not too early, not too late. Certainly, you don't want to be late but not too early as well. But I think the, at the end of the day, the issue really goes back to sensitizing stakeholders to risk. If we, if we take the position that uh, markets are perfect, there's nothing wrong with it, we're all good, then it's going to be very difficult to talk about risk. Everybody in this call understand that there's no such thing as a perfectly safe market. Risk is endemic to finance. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to communicate it. So one practical approach, Santi, and uh, uh, we've had the pleasure of doing it uh, through your initiatives as well, is to try to have uh, mini talks. Uh, we call it kapihan. Literally, kape means coffee. So coffee table discussions, closed door, no media. So you can freely talk. Uh, there'll be an issue raised, uh, some uh, one or two speakers uh, on stage and just uh, open the floor. Uh, you do it frequently enough, I, I think you you improve the traction with the market. Uh, so there will be no surprises. It also goes to the point of Oliver earlier about regulation. Sometimes, um, or perhaps a key requirement of any intervention, whether it's uh, preemptive or reactive, you have to explain to the market what it is you're trying to do. Sometimes you need to listen to the market that we are we regulators are overacting and hopefully there's something we see that the market does not see. We have some data that the market would net not necessarily see and we can share that and explain to them why we think we need to intervene. There has to be some meeting of the mind because without buy-in, uh, none of this will even work. I still have another question actually I'd like to ask you. But I heard you, uh, Johnny, about molding risk behaviors. That's really part of the objective. Uh, and I, I uh, how do you, you know, how do you really manage public behavior when, uh, for example, I, you, I also read in, in the framework of which you must have been a part of, uh, changing risk behaviors. And this means the behavior of persons with uh, different roles in the financial system. Bank depositors who may wish to withdraw their deposits uh, in panic. Investors who may rush to sell their shareholdings. Lenders who suddenly shut down their credit windows. Borrowers who decide to withhold payments. It is very difficult to control or predict their individual and collective behavior, which certainly can magnify the adverse consequences of systemic risks. In your experience, what has been the most effective proven tools of anticipatory preparation and action? I will answer it again with, uh, with communication is the best uh, particular way to do this. It's very... Uh, sometimes the 
we get so engrossed with the methodologies and the math that we fail to take the last mile. And the last mile is to talk to people and to listen to their concerns. One particular threshold or benchmark that I hold dear is a stable financial system uh, must be able to do the same things in good times and in stress times. Even if during stress times, everybody will try to do what they want to do. Withdraw money, for example, as precautionary money. So the idea is really to not to forecast the most likely event. The idea is to prepare for the suite of possible events. So you need to be able to prepare for liquidity. You need to be able to say in a payment scheme, what have, what's our plan B? What's our contingency plan if uh, all the internet uh, systems are down? Um, how do you clear and set it? Uh, if, if you're moving from, and, and you know this, Santi, if you're moving from the equities market, which is uh, probably T plus two, the bond market is T plus one. There's some latency risk involved. So what's the game plan uh, if, if somebody is caught in between? Uh, when prices uh, move during those transition periods, all of that has to be put in place. So uh, we're, we put together a conceptual framework called the Systemic Risk Crisis Management Framework. It's... Uh, Right now, it, uh, the draft is on, on the BSP website, uh, also on the website of the Financial Stability Coordination Council, and it outlines uh, essentially what we will do. Now, we will try to fill up the specifics. Uh, for example, the methodologies that we will use to determine a crisis. When is it a crisis and when is it just difficult times? That transition, has to be made. Uh, if, uh, for example, the uh, uh, there is something that happens in the market, uh, is there an automatic way for the payments to be escrowed? Or is it necessarily carried over to the next trading day? All of those uh, small details have to be considered, but it has to be fully uh, discussed with the market. Uh, so communication and preparedness would be my two answers to your question. I, I saw a comment about too big to fail. Uh, the reason it is called a systemically important financial institution, CFIS, whether it's a bank or a non-bank, that the term is systemically important, meaning there is some determination that in the event of some difficulty, the ultimate impact is not just on the institution, but on the system as a whole. Please take a look at the framework for uh, global uh, SIBs, you know, systemically important bank. You talk about size, you talk about, uh, inter uh, you talk about uh, complexity, you talk about substitutability, and you talk about interconnectedness. All of those, if you look at the description and the way it is calculated, all of those will talk about size. A big bank on its own will have large exposures. A big bank that tends to dominate the payment system cannot be substituted easily and therefore will be normally a systemically important bank and so forth and so on. The point we're making is uh, other than size, a smaller institution can be systemic if they're heavily interconnected with everybody else. So you can see in, in many jurisdictions, uh, there are big banks that are more conservative in their handling of their portfolio. There are not so big banks, which are very aggressive in their intermediation process and they, their, uh, their participation in the capital markets, for example. So it is, uh, it is not going to be limited to a deposit loan type of scenario. Uh, most banks today normally actively participate in uh, capital markets, uh, we'll have subsidiaries that are in the pension system, uh, private or, or public at that. So that level of interconnectedness has to be accounted for, for systemic risk purposes. Thank you very much. And as a closing statement, uh, 
I, I, let me just recall what I heard from our former BSP Governor Philip Medalia uh, during that uh, Cebu conference on financial stability. He said that, uh, and I think this is really should be the problem. This is really the problem very often. And he says, it's complacency. Complacency sets in with long periods of financial stability. You know, like the great moderation that you were describing. Complacency sets in with long periods of financial stability. Old bankers forget the causes of the financial instability of the past. And the new bankers do not have any memory of the problems of the past. And so we must design the tools to manage systemic risks before they happen, not after they have happened. And as you say, uh, Noet, much still has to be understood. 